Today we're talking about Andy Stanley again, really asking this specific question. Should he step down? In fact, maybe just in good conscience calling on him to do so because of his stance on various issues, his not only underhanded, but just kind of sloppy way that he handles the scriptures. I think the office of the pastor is deserving of more than he is given it. And just the overall arrogance with which he leads his ministry and expects people to kind of go along with what he does. These are certainly things that are not in line with a uh, biblical pastor, the way that the Apostle Paul described it. And so assessing that, but taking a look at the last few minutes of this video. So a little shout out to Honest Youth Pastor for doing this. He actually, he's done this for several several pastors, obviously done a lot of homework. I don't know how he researches and gets all the information that he does, but we're going to take a look at uh, just basically the last several minutes of his video, which is assessing Andy's preaching style and how it evolved as well as some of the dangers of his ministry. Andy is attempting to stay true yet again to his mission of making a church for unchurched people, shifting his methods as needed to do so. Andy adapts his language in order to stay true and engage with the audience he's trying to reach. He mentions this in an interview with Russell Moore. He said a couple of years ago that we shouldn't say the Bible says. What do you mean when you say we we shouldn't say the Bible says, is it? Well, yeah, no, I'm glad you asked that. The reason I encourage pastors not to say the Bible says, the scripture teaches those things, if, it, if it's a bunch of Christians and it's a bunch of people who take the Bible seriously, we're good to go. And for generations in our culture, we got by with it. But it's, I just learned through experience, I have removed an unnecessary obstacle when I say to, a, to not just un, non-Christians, but Christians who are having doubts about the scripture perhaps. When I say, it's just a more direct route to say, Jesus taught. The Apostle Paul, who, by the way, used to hate Christians. Anybody here hate Christians? You love the Apostle Paul. He hated Christians. I think it is an easier on-ramp for people who are distant, distancing, doubting, to start with the authority of the, of the author than to start with the Bible. And the other reason is this, and, and you know this. It's not what the Bible says that's the issue. It's what else the Bible says. Uh, he's doing what he's doing here, Don. Is he's uh, we've watched several of his videos at this point, but he is explaining his uh, apologetic when he's when he's talking to people, mm-hmm. and the reason he doesn't say the Bible says, you know, he he, he goes to great lengths to say Jesus said, or um, you know, kind of. Uh, not necessarily just water the Bible down, but he. It seems to me you'll, you'll see here in a second. It seems to me that he's assuming the Bible is not true. That there's evidences against the Bible, which obviously we would disagree with, you know, I I mean, if there were, why not, or if somebody had a question, why not spend time um, disproving that uh, assertion about the Bible not being true, that there's no evidence for uh, a global flood, hypothetically, there's, Mm -hmm. there's a ridiculous amount of evidence for a global flood, but why, why not, you know, why not spend time doing that instead of just saying, well, we don't need to do this. Let's just say Jesus said, and, and so on, you know, so just kind of like, I don't know, kind of like dumbing, a a dumbed down apologetic approach. Well, you know, (laughs) it's it's funny that you said that for the simple fact is this, I was just sitting here thinking, does he really believe in the word of God? Yeah. And then you said what you had to say. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's it's really something, and obviously it's rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. Um, you'll see a lot of clips, kind of a, a montage of things, you know, put in here where you can get a lot of it in perspective, so we'll continue. And again, w- w- when you're dealing with secular people, as soon as you say the Bible, everybody now knows all the problems with the Bible. And when I say problems, the problems in terms of the culture's view of the Bible, in terms of six days creation, no <laughs> geological evidence for a worldwide flood, and there's no evidence for the Exodus. There's all, all kinds of things that people can poke at, poke at, poke at. So, you know, I mean, this is exactly what I was just talking. He's like, he, he just, I think he believes those statements. Well, he must or he wouldn't say them. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like he's not just saying, he's not just criticizing and saying, this is the argument that you'll get. I go to great lengths. I mean, I've even interviewed like PhD geologists and, um, you know, people who have have immersed their life in the study of uh, the farce Mm -hmm. of evolution. Um, 
you, you know, my whole ministry, my apologetic is to try to show people that evolution is a religion. Evolution is based on faith. Evolution has no evidence for it. There's no, ev- there's no missing links. Like, exactly. I mean, so it's almost like he's just assuming that what the critic, what the pagan critic says is true. And, and, and then he's, you know, developing his biblical, um, his preaching style. This isn't just his apologetic, it's his preaching style, mm-hmm. right? I mean, he's, this is how he's preaching in his church. Well, when you look at his preaching, he doesn't really believe in the Bible because certain sins and that that are in the Bible, and they talk about, you know, things that you shouldn't do and yeah. this and that. He's condoning. So, you know, does he really believe in the Bible at all, or does he just think it's some book that was thrown out there and it's not led by God? And it was written by the Holy Spirit through man. And, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know how you can't believe in it. Yeah. I mean, I can understand it maybe from a person that doesn't know anything about the Bible saying what he's saying. But supposedly his father was a preacher. He's a preacher. Charles Stanley. I mean, not just any preacher, but he, his father yeah. was Charles Stanley. And he's got a degree. Right. A Bible degree. A, a master's degree, I think, from... From Dallas Theological Seminary, you know, so let's let's continue. And when we dis when they in their minds can discredit parts, it discredits the whole. This is a good place to dive in and actually look at Andy Stanley's preaching and how it's changed over time. The best way to do this is to actually compare four messages from the year 2000 with four messages from the year 2023. The first set of messages was preached only five years after North Point Community Church had started in the year 2000. The series name was Discovering God's Will, and in this series, Andy Stanley brought forth four different sermons. In his first sermon, he basically sets the ground rules for the next three, saying that God has providential will and moral will. Both of these wills can be seen throughout the scriptures, and during this sermon, he points to a number of different scriptures within the Old and New Testament. In the second sermon of this series, he talks about godly counsel and how often God's will can be discovered through the wise and godly people that God has put in our life. Again, offering a lot of verses to back that up. In the third sermon of this series, Andy talks about how God's word has been given to the believers so that we can know what his will is and we can discern what we're supposed to do in it. Referring to the scriptures as God's word a number of times. In the last sermon oh, of this... Oh, wow. Did, <laughs> referring to the scriptures as God's word a number of times. Oh, okay. Wow. That's, uh, series. Andy talks about God's <laughs> vision for us. He's calling the Bible what it is. Like, yeah. The idea that we can find out God's will when we know his providential <laughs> will and his moral will. How bad is it, by the way, that we're, we're actually talking about a minister and we're saying he is, and, and this is a, a prominent minister in our in our nation. Right. Uh, he is, uh, we're giving him credit for calling the Bible God's word. How far have our standards fallen? Well, <laughs> and follow the things that he's laid out in scripture, both from the Old and New Testament. This is in stark contrast to his most recent series in 2023, a series he's still working through, called The Fundamentalist. The purpose of this series, Andy says, is to get down to the bare bones of what Christians must believe in order to be Christian. Preaching the first sermon entitled, Hang On to Baby Jesus, in which he talks about a singular passage out of Matthew chapter 16 between Peter and Christ, saying that the first major fundamental thing that one must believe to be Christian is that Jesus is the Christ, the last king that God has sent, his only son. In the second sermon, entitled The Shadowcaster, Andy preaches out of John chapter 14, in which Jesus explains that if they've seen him, they've seen the Father. Andy's point being that Jesus is the example of God. What Jesus does is who God is. Then, in the third sermon, covering sin, specifically pointing to the greatest commandment found in Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. Essentially defining sin not as disobedience to God or his law, but rather sin is defined as not loving your neighbor. Essentially asking them, if it harms another person, it's sin. If it's not good for you, no can do. And if it's not good for them, it should be condemned. There are a few differences in these series spread across 23 years. The first is that in the first series back in 2000, there are so many Bible references. Andy's entire case is built upon the scriptures. And time and time again, he points believers and non-believers to the scriptures, encouraging both to read them and learn about who God is. 
And, and he doesn't do that anymore. <laughs> and after learning about him, to follow him. This is in sharp contrast to the 2023 series in which Andy spends a great deal of his opening sections almost urging people to question the scriptures, using language that's incredibly confusing without clarifying it, and not really speaking of the scriptures as authoritative for life and practice of the believers or pointing unbelievers to the scriptures that tell the story leading up to Jesus. I like how he explained that there because he emphasizes the fact that uh, when Andy Stanley speaks, he's using confusing language. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, like when, when he's asked about these different things and he's trying to explain how, you know, the Bible is not the word of God. I've played a clip on here before of him saying, the problem with Christianity is that we were taught the Bible. <laughs> so like, you know, like, it, what do you mean by that? I think as a preacher, you have an obligation to be clear to not be ambiguous, or to try to be clear, mm -hmm. at least. I mean, even Paul, who's teaching difficult things to his original audience about the new covenant and salvation by grace through faith alone mm -hmm. in Christ, not having to be circumcised, these are difficult things for his original audience to hear, but it wasn't like he was being ambiguous. Right. You know, he was, he was clearly explaining for the sheep so that they could walk down the paths of life. That's the whole point. But, you know, when you, when, when you try to be mysterious in what you're saying and in your own mind, you're smarter than everybody else in the room, this is a, this is a big problem. Well, he's, he, I don't know if he's got a chip on his shoulder or whether he believes exactly what's coming out of his mouth, but I can't understand how he could get up on a Sunday and preach knowing full well that what he's preaching is not biblical. To a great extent. Yeah, well, I think that's what he thinks is that he thinks that he, he is being biblical, and he thinks, even though clearly it's not, right? it doesn't matter because he's smarter than everyone else in the room in his own mind. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and this is the arrogance the, of... Uh, of the he does here. often tell people that if what the Gospels are saying is true, they should consider it and change their life to follow it. This, but however, is something. The difference... I mean... I, the first video there, I think, I, you know, there that's it's got the old three four resolution, <laughs> but it's like, my goodness, like I, that's like when I started seminary back in two thousand five two thousand six, and uh, you know, it's like that in my mind, Don. That wasn't that long ago. I know I'm getting no. kind of old, man, but like that wasn't that long ago. And, and he's preaching, like, look at how his preaching has changed in twenty years. Less than 20 years. Yeah, less than 20, and, and what's so sad is, like, how does a pastor go from that to that? Well, you know what I think? I think he's believing his own garbage is coming out of his mouth. That's what I believe. Yeah. Instead of believing the Word of God. I mean, because we can get led astray by the wor world. I mean, you know, you quote a scripture, and then you try to analyze it and tear it apart and so on, and you end up in left field instead of right on track with God. And then you go back, and when you start reading the chapter and d dwelling into it more, you see, oh, my goodness, I was wrong in how I assumed that this piece of Scripture or this teaching was the way I, I did it. it was, it's totally off base. Yeah. He don't seem to go back to the Word of God and try to correct himself no. and, and, and say, okay, Lord, was I right or am I wrong? Show me. I don't see that happening. He keeps going down this path more and more and more to where he's going to the left rather than down the middle you know, with the Lord. Yeah, and I, I just think, too, like, I, I remember I did a series called Mean Jesus, like, mm -hmm. a couple years ago. Yep. And what it was all about was how Jesus was, um, he went into the temple with cords. He told mm -hmm. Peter, Peter, Peter. <laughs> oh, God. he told Peter, <laughs> get behind me, Satan. <laughs> I see you laughing over there. He told, he told Peter, get behind me, Satan. Right. And, um, and, and so the whole point was that like, we have this culture of niceness today mm -hmm. and like Jesus, as he was portrayed in the Bible, doesn't necessarily fit in with our culture of niceness, but I would begin every single teaching by saying, I don't think Jesus was mean. I would like, I was very right. clear in that. What really is really troubling about his preaching style is, is he seems to like thrive off of just making these outrageous statements 
The problem with Christianity is that we were taught the Bible. And Mm -hmm. that's not, you know, that's not a statement that you can make without massive clarification. And then you, you can't run a ministry with just outlandish statement after outlandish statement. It really causes for lots of concern. And honestly, that's why he's such a lightning rod. I don't think he can say, I'm being targeted. You can say that if you have one mistake, but mm-hmm. but if you if your ministry is characterized by just unwise word choices, I mean, and, and, and then they're intentional too. That's the thing is it's not like it was an accident. And I can only assume all of this has changed and pivoted on what we've talked about before, that video from Sam Harris. And these implications go far deeper than just a change in how we talk about the Bible. They have implications for every part of the believer's life. I talked about this in a previous video, but that guy in the middle there, Sam Harris, that's uh, an atheist that somebody sent Andy a, a video like back in 2012. And this, uh, he's told this story before how it pivoted his entire preaching. And that's, that's where he came up with this whole preaching style that he has today. It was from an atheist. And, and the atheist was, it was a clip of an atheist debunking Christianity. <laughs> You know, so if you were to compare the old sermons from the 2000 and the new sermons from 2023, what you're going to find is the way he speaks of the scriptures is very different. Ask the question, God, I want to know your ways. I want to know your thoughts. Show me, help me discover and root out and dig out the principles, the way you have put this world together so that I can begin to see as you see, think as you think and develop my ways in accordance with yours. That's what a principle is. Let me give you some examples to make sure we're all on the same page. Sometimes principles are stated. Let (laughs) me read you a couple of examples and you've heard most of these. Here's some stated principles. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. In other words, whatever you put into something, you can expect to get something similar out. Maybe you're not a Christian or not a religious person and you think, well, I knew that. I mean, that's true whether it's in the Bible or not. I mean, I, I, don't, I knew that. And I don't know anything about the Bible. Of course, you reap what you sow. Everybody, it's just sort of a universal principle. Everybody knows that. Where do you think that came from? Why is that true? Why is that an indisputable law that's both in nature and in relationships? Where, where did that come from? It came from God. God set that in motion. That's the way God works. In the 2000s, the scriptures are the foundation of all that he speaks about. Whether it be for believers or unbelievers, he points everyone to them for life and practice. In 2023, that has shifted. His presentation style is vastly different, and it does call into question by the words he uses if he actually thinks unbelievers should find life and practical applications in the scriptures. I'd say it's how your behavior and mine impacts other people. So this is essential. It's fundamental that we view sin the way our Savior views sin. Jesus defines sin as anything that harms you or others. Whether it shows up on a sin list or not, whether it appears in our Bible or not. I feel like his voice just makes me want to puke. A terrifying question. And then I'm gonna ask you to respond, which is gonna be even more terrifying. So don't tune out or go anywhere, okay? Here's the question. Uh, no, the half the church already left, buddy. <laughs> That'd be one of them. <laughs> Are you harming you or others? What? <laughs> what? This is like the, uh, you know, this is the common, like, logic for sexual immorality. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, isn't that what you'll hear people say who, you know, they, they want to justify their lifestyle? They'll say, oh, yeah. uh, you know, they'll say, well, it's not harming myself or, or anybody else. You can't, you, you can't tell me what to do. I mean, is this, is this just kind of like, like preaching an ethic that the culture, the culture uses, <laughs> the culture came up with and the culture uses to Why justify you- gross, negligent, sinful behavior? Well, I used to be in a celebrate recovery, which is people that were on you know, dope or, or drugs or yeah. just b- b- bad habits, overeating and so on and so forth. But I've had people say to me, well, I'm working, I'm making the money. So what does it matter if I drink or take drugs? Because I'm paying for that. <laughs> so why should I? Why shouldn't yeah. I? I'm the one covering it all. They must have been listening to his sermons. <laughs> and that's what I mean. And I sit there and I just look at them and say, yeah, you're making the money, but that don't give you the opportunity to, to go against and ruin your body yeah. and, and going against the Bible. Yeah. Don't say that in God's word. Stop it. 
In 2023, exactly. that has completely shifted. And the Stop language it. that Andy uses in regards to the scriptures and everything they talk about is much different. And this is where a majority of the questions about Andy's view of scripture come into play. Andy's primary focus now undoubtedly is the resurrection. He talks about it constantly, as he should, but then it calls into question about his view on the rest of the scriptures. In the 2000s, he referred often to the Old Testament, but now rarely does, even though the gospel writers that he's quoting often point back to them. And so there's a lot of confusion here, confusion that we don't have a lot of clarity on, but this is something that Andy's not unaware of. In fact, he's used to being misunderstood, as he says here. Aww. And one of the things that we are commonly criticized for and misunderstood <laughs> for is our approach to church and cultural engagement and church being not just the preaching part, but the whole thing. And if um, I, I think of a sermon series like the. I feel sorry for him. I church, really he's, de- he's describing church to us. He's explaining like we don't know. You know, Don, we're so dumb. I mean, not just the uh, the preaching part, but the whole thing, not just the, pre- the whole thing, the whole thing, the cultural engagement, you know, I, because I say cultural engagement, you're supposed to know that that's, I'm, I'm smarter than everybody, and I use big words like that, so I, I know more, so does you're that, dumb. Does that remind you of anything? Of what's going on in our government right yeah, now. Yeah, I mean, it's it's exactly this. He's, yeah, he's like a carbon copy of the, yeah. yeah they're smarter than everybody else. Yeah. And he's smarter yeah. than everybody else. Yep, exactly the same thing. And all they do is go in a circle. Yeah. That's all they do. And we're dumb. And we're the dumb yeah. ones. But like and we're, said, we're evil. You know, that's, uh, mm-hmm. like, that's what he's, you look at his little sermons that he's done. I mean, it's the, the people that are in his congregation that disagree with him, we're evil. The haters, they're evil. They're bad. You know, it couldn't be that he made a mistake, that he has a wrong approach. It couldn't be that he's a lightning rod because he deserves to be. So nobody wants to sit through a three and a half hour sermon, so we spread it out over a bunch of weeks. So if you show up at the introduction week, you might think, do they use the Bible? Hmm. If you show up at the last week, you might think, do they always have people stand up and pray to receive Christ? So you you have to come for about six weeks. You know, like, this is kind of like a something that I've noticed about like sociopaths abusers is that they project like you see that like like people who are dealing with something internally they project it out you know like accusing other people um when they're doing it themselves yeah it was actually I think it was a strategy um I could be way off on this but I, I'm almost positive this was a strategy of Karl Marx you know the, the communist communist manifesto that it was like basically just to create chaos and confusion accuse the other side of what you're doing and like i just see projection all over the place with this guy here like he thinks he thinks he knows what like you know nobody wants to sit through a three three hour church service like i if it's a good sermon i will i mean there's there's good preachers you can look at look him up and you know he's not one of them but like you can look up good preachers who people like they're kind of bummed out when the sermon's over. Mm-hmm. I've been there, done that. Right? Oh yeah. I mean, like it was like it was ten minutes long. Yeah, it's like, and it's like it that's over? that's so. So this is just just like a, a maybe a light bulb moment, but uh, like what if what if what if we work on our preaching style? Right. Well, it, <laughs> it's like it's like what if um. So if an atheist doesn't believe and they have objections to the Bible, what if we work on our apologetic? What if we study the topics that they're bringing up so that we have an answer for the hope that we have on instead of just dumbing everything down and making it unnecessary and just labeling them a Christian? What if we actually just work on our preaching style? Depending on what service you come to, you may be confused about what the church actually does and why they do it. According to Andy himself, depending on which service you come to, you may not even think they use the Bible. And so when he says that the apostles unhitched the Christian faith from the Jewish scriptures, Ah, or that the Bible says it's not an adequate starting or returning point for many adults, the questions that are asked are reasonable. And it's here that we see the second thing that Andy Stanley seems to have shifted his opinion on, the topic of LGBTQ plus relationships, and more specifically, the relation to Christianity. Quickly, I want to introduce you to Greg and Lynn McDonald, who attend one of our churches. This is their story, and they were so gracious to share their story with us on video. Now, this is emotional. Uh, In fact, if you so far have disagreed... They were so gracious. Those pagans... 
were so gracious. You Christians are so evil and vile. With everything I've said, you're going to feel like this is cheating. And there you go, Andy, you're not giving the scripture. Last night you gave us a lot of scripture. Now you're going to tell us a bunch of stories. Okay, I understand that. We're, I'm going to get to that in just a minute. But this is the reality for those of us who are in ministry. Again, if we're all just public speakers running around or you could just bloggers and, you know, it would be easy. But we're dealing with real people and real relationships and, and real people that we love. So we have to figure this out. It is not political for me. It is not political for you, is it? It is relational because we're in ministry. And because we've learned to distinguish between theology and ministry, we can figure this out. Not only does this show us Andy Stanley's view on the local church and who can serve and who cannot serve within it, but it also gives us some indicators of what his position may be on the topic. Now, I think this is a good place to interject that an employee for North Point Community Churches that wish to remain anonymous did reach out and say that the church has, like many churches do, a family ministry agreement. This agreement recognizes God's design for marriage. With the FMA me. and the church bylaws, they explicitly say you cannot condone, nor pursue, nor be involved in a same-sex attracted relationship. Now, I can't find, nor was I provided, documentation on either one of these policies or agreements. However, I was... Probably because they don't exist. I, <laughs> what is a family... What do they call it? A family agreement? Family ministry agreement? What? I, I'm confused there. I mean, they can't just... Can we call it, like, truth like biblical truth or <laughs> assured by this anonymous source that they have denied service opportunities as well as marriages because of both of these policies so it is interesting that the unconditional conference put up by embracing the journey is a conference that's being held at north point the unconditional conference very website says that they are inviting you to the conference for a two-day premiere event for parents of lgbtq plus children and for ministry leaders looking to discover ways to support parents and lgbtq plus children in their churches it goes on to say that you will be equipped refreshed and inspired as you hear from leading communicators on topics that speak to your heart soul and mind we deeply desire that this time will bring about healing and restoration Finishing with, no matter what theological stance you hold, we invite you to listen, reflect, and learn as we approach this topic from the quieter middle. Out of all of the speakers that will be giving presentations at the conference, four of those speakers are on the North Point Community Church staff. Two of the most notable names are Andy Stanley himself, as well as his care ministry director, Debbie Causey. What's further concerning is just Sheesh. a small amount of research into the other people that will be speaking at the conference that are not employed by North Point Community Church will show you that they are LGBTQ plus affirming. Oh. In fact, many of them are contenders for LGBTQ plus inclusion within the local church body, holding to a theology that homosexuality is an orientation that can be faithfully lived out in one's Christian walk, not a walk of repentance or freedom from sin or even a life of wow. celibacy lived in submission to Christ, but rather a walk that can be faithfully lived out within an LGBTQ plus lifestyle. All of this seems to be smaller pieces to a larger puzzle. So that when we all saw that clip go viral of Andy Stanley at the Drive Conference in 22 talking about LGBTQ plus, we were all surprised. However, as the other things we've talked about, this seems to be more of a logical conclusion and a position that he may hold. He hasn't clarified, so we're not really that sure. To add a bit to this confusion, North Point Community Church, under their care ministry, led by Debbie Causey, also has something called Parent Connect. Parent Connect is very closely tied to the Embrace the Journey conference, specifically Embrace existing for journey? parents within North Point that have LGBTQ plus identifying children. It's about how your parent can oh, connect she looks is structured. Like a so we child. have several yeah. groups that meet once a month. Um, and then once a quarter, we all come together at um, our main campus. We have a camp, a church that has about eight campuses. And so we all come together uh, at one of the campuses and hear from a speaker. Um, we got to hear from Mama Tammy in October, and that was so much fun. Mama uh, She was Tammy. from the show Queer Eye, if you're not familiar. It's oh. a great episode about the church oh. Um, oh. and uh, the no, LGBT I community. I know, Don. I regularly watch the show Queer Eye. How about you? <laughs> like, uh, like, where do you even begin? Like, where do you where do you begin with with how like far off 
this is? Like, where do you even begin? It's like, it's, I feel like it's kind of like, it's so far off. It would be like trying to go to an, a person that lived in ancient times and explain to them how to use an iPhone. Hmm. Like, how would you even, how would you describe that? It's like, that's what we're wrestling with here. It's like, how do it, it common sense tells you this is just bad. This is not good. These are all the, the wrong people. I wish Paul was around. Oh, to see this. I mean, he would be flipping out. Oh, he, people he, think, people think, you know, people think Jesus was mean when he cleared the temple. I think it would have been real interesting. <laughs> <laughs> there had definitely been a huge I mean, discussion. Holy cow. Holy cow. You know, the, I mean, the idea of affirming is not biblical. Affirming sin. Like mm-hmm. the whole idea of affirming. Like right. you're you're living in sin. It's okay. Oh, it's okay. You're doing what you have to do. Oh, like it's like baby talk to me. You well, know, does it say that in the Bible that we're supposed to bend to sin? We're supposed to go to the Lord and beg and help us to get out of whatever sinful yeah. things that are going on. Like, so we don't go to hell. Right. Right? I mean, and, and suffer the consequences here as well. I mean, it's like, you know, obviously I, I'm a believer in eternal security right. and per, or what, you know, as a Calvinist you would call perseverance right. of the saints. I mean, so, I you know, a, an evidence that you are not going to hell <laughs> Is, is your perseverance over sin in your life. And that right. doesn't mean that you're perfect. Right. But Nobody's generally perfect. speaking, yeah, generally speaking, you're not a total piece of crud. I mean, you know, you're not worse than the atheists and the pagans and the unbelievers, generally speaking. So the Bible doesn't affirm. And this is the other thing that's really an insult. <clears throat> My, this, this just kind of infuriates me. What about all the people that have actually been victorious over sins in their life? Each and every one of us have defeated sin. We have to every day. You know, you th- think about like my father who was an alcoholic who had 37 years of sobriety, mm-hmm. couldn't take a drink of alcohol, didn't take a drink of alcohol his entire life until the day that he died for 37 years. That's really something. And, I mean... You're a strong Christian. I'm a strong Christian. We defeat sin every day. Oh, yeah. We have to. We're not perfect, but we actually fi- we actually fight against it, and right. we actually defeat it. So it's basically like saying, like, you guys need to fight against it, but and but no, but these people don't. No, it's all right. And why? Why? Like, what is the logical reason that these people don't have to fight against their sin like I have to fight against my sin? What? Why? Because their sin, like, deserves special treatment? Because the, is it because they're dumb and they don't understand? I mean, what, are we dumbing everything down? Everybody wants to apologize to everybody else about whatever is going Unbelievable. on. Unbelievable! You look at that on TV so much, especially in the federal government, and now you see it in the church with him. And you've got to apologize. You've got to change because you're offending somebody. Well, did that ever run across God's mind? No. He says the way it is, the way it is. I, I if you don't accept I, it, too bad. You would think that that it was written in the Ten Commandments yeah. not to be offensive. That's the, that's if number just, eleven. Yeah, if you that if you shall not be if offensive. you parachute it got lot broken off. Yeah, if you parachute it into our culture today, you you wouldn't think the Ten Commandments are what they actually are. You would think that they no. were like you know, thou shalt not be offensive, yeah. thou shalt be nice. And with whatever that even means. Like, I don't, I don't even know what the word nice means today. Go along with going along. <laughs> yeah, thou shalt go along. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> you shall go along. Yeah, like, uh, thou shalt affirm. Um, you know, we could we could go on. This, there's four of the ten right there. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, but it's like, it's just really so upside down, and it's so, it's so offensive to truth. Like, for... For a culture that's trying not to offend, they're offending God. Oh, definitely. And they're and they're offending people because you know you think about people, and as a pastor, like I, you know, I think about people will humble me sometimes because I look at what they deal with, you know, and I can whine and I can complain to God for for my gripes and my problems and my things, and then I see somebody that's got it worse than me, 
Mm-hmm. And they're living a more victorious Christian lifestyle than I'm living with worse. Right. And I'm humbled and I go, I, I need to shut up. I can shut my mouth. And it's like to mm-hmm. those people, like, let's, let's show respect to those people. You know, like instead of showing respect to the pagans, let's show respect to the people of God. Let's love the children of God. Let's honor the sacrifices that they're making to be victorious yeah. in Christ every day. And, and for, I, can, I can think of people right now, I mean, that I know they're, they're struggling hard. Some people struggling with physical problems. Some people struggling with, you know, life circumstances that are horrible. That are some, some people struggling with mental problems, like real mental problems, and depression, anxiety, you know, schizophrenia, whatever, bipolar, and and they're victorious in Christ. They're not perfect, but they're making it, and they're fighting against it. This is my question for a conference like this, is like, wouldn't you go get people who have been victorious? Aren't those the ones that should be talking to these kids? Exactly. What the heck are they doing? Like, what are they doing? And you've got a whole church culture today that's doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. They're doing this. There's churches in my community that are doing this. Right. There's churches in our country that are doing this. Mm-hmm. Stupidity, blatant, immoral, gross stupidity. It's not going to be honored by God. These people are not going to be victorious. You are hurting them because you think you're smarter than everybody else, you know. And the other thing is too, when he gets up in front of Jesus Christ on judgment day, yeah. Exactly. What is going to happen exactly. when he says you've had all these people you yeah. led astray right, right. by what you <clears throat> Lord, taught. I affirmed them. Yeah. Mhm. Like that's going to count. I affirmed them. I mean, what's he going to say about the people? Obviously, I'm a Calvinist. I don't believe somebody can not get saved that was supposed to be saved. True. But like, you know, hypothetically, like what about the person that was, what about the person that would have had victory? Let's say it like this. <laughs> what about the person that would have had victory? The one, if you would have actually just preached the Bible, I'm saying the Bible, like the Bible, like I'm saying it, <laughs> I can say it. We can use the word, the Bible. It's the word of God. We can use it. It's okay. It's not an outdated term. It's, it's a book. The culture is full of lies. The Bible isn't right. Cultural history is trash and garbage and lies. The Bible isn't, but biblical history is true. Amen. The Exodus is true. Mount Sinai is true. Noah's flood was true. God created ex nihilo, not in a big bang and not over billions of years. Sorry, scientists, but the Bible's true. Let's just preach that Bible. How about that? Um, And so we meet once a month as groups and once a quarter in homes, and we cover a topic that's in our uh, conversation guide. It might be grief, like we talked about today, safety, um, giving up your rights as parents. Um, It might be about acceptance. It could be about all different kinds of things. Uh, Anger, um, grace. Does this make you more noble in today's culture? It's like you're more noble if you just accept like what is, is like it. It's like, I just get the impression. It's like, you're more noble if you accept the modern family. Like I don't accept it. I never will. I I will die in a lack of acceptance. I just feel sorry for them that they're under such a delusion and and when the Bible speaks about that, that there's a spirit of delusion, yeah. and we're actually seeing it ever since uh, COVID nineteen. the The whole country has like been flipped upside down, <clears throat> and it's gone between the government first, with dictating when you can do stuff, and you got to get this many shots, and you can't go out; you have to stay six foot behind. They find out that all this is garbage; it's nothing but a lie that was collimated by some doctors, and then. Now you've got the church that has picked up on this trend, so to speak, and now they're pushing their agenda down people's throats that's not biblical. And since when isn't God relevant? When isn't Jesus relevant? He's always been relevant, and he always will be relevant. And that's the thing of it. How can you go and just disband all this and throw it to the side and walk away and say, well, that's the way it is today? You can't. Yeah. 
your purpose and all of this, you know, Parent Connects uh, two goals is to love your kid well and to find out where God has you on the journey. So anything that has to do with that, we'll that is, sometimes talk about theology, the but it's not I mean, for that... us to um, tell people what their theology should be, but oh, oh. to seek a journey in oh, what, what I their see. theology is. Aren't you teaching them a theology? Yeah. I mean, are. isn't, isn't, didn't she just declare a theology? She, you know, umbrella theology over all the other that trumps all other theology. I mean, I, that's a theology like love. What does she say? Love well and figure out what your part is in the journey. Yeah. In the journey. Oh, that sounds like a lot of fun. Wow. I, man, uh, sign Why me do you up have for to that. Figure it out. It's in the Bible. All you have to do is read it. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you have to figure out anything? However, this is not a cares ministry in order to help the parents walk faithfully with their children, pointing them to repentance in Christ, but rather this is a ministry to help parents walk with their children and affirm them in their sexuality. These Parent wow. Connect meetings typically have people from the wow. LGBTQ plus community on panels explaining how they came to terms with their sexuality and gender and how they live with that alongside their Christian faith as well as having breakout sessions in which the people on the panel then speak to the parents and the children about how they can do the same. So the question wow. really becomes, where does Andy himself stand on this position? The other things that Good we've looked at, we've able to yeah. sort of tie up. Yeah. We've sort I mean, the sad thing is we know. It's not, it's, there's no mystery. It's clear. I mean, it's, it, it's just that he's not clear, but, you know, no offense, we're not stupid like he thinks we are, right. you know, <laughs> did the dots A to B. But with this specific topic, I'm sort of lost. There's no definitive proof that he leans one way or the other, other than the ministry agreements that everyone that works for North Point must sign. What's a bit more confusing are the speakers that were chosen for this conference. There's a lot of confusion. I have no idea who sure. actually chose them, but it is being hosted at North Point, and therefore it's sort of a sign of approval in some regards. I say this because there are other speakers that hold a more biblical position on this topic than the ones that are actually going to be speaking at the conference. So all of that right. to say, we still don't know where Andy yeah. stands on this. Why aren't they However, speaking at the conference? However, there is a hint of possibly yeah. knowing. And I do need to say this is totally third party. I have no idea the validity of the statements that are about to be made, but the reality is they were made, and as far as I know, they've never been addressed by Andy. I also think it's important to note that the North Point pastor that did reach out to me told me he was going to give me a more balanced perspective on this take, and still has yet to do so. But that brings into the picture Ryan Visconti. Ryan Visconti is the lead pastor at Generation Church in Arizona. He had a tweet go viral on January 25th of 2023 in which he recounts a small group that he was in with Andy Stanley September 19th of 2019. Huh. The group had been gathered for a Q&A with Andy after a large conference that he had spoken at, and the subject eventually comes up about homosexuality. Ryan claims for the next hour and a half a very tense conversation took place. You can go read the tweet if you'd like, but this is what Ryan said on an interview with Remnant Radio. I have a sense from hearing him talk that he has a strong sense of compassion for lost people. I know that scripture, do not make it difficult for the Gentiles to come to faith, is one that really shapes a lot of his framework for reaching lost people. And it sounds like, based on what he said, he believes that there are people who are homosexual, that they cannot change. And that was one of the things we asked him about because he said they can't change. I, we asked him, what about 1 Corinthians 6, which says that is what some of you were. And he just doesn't believe it's the same as it is today, that there's something different about the dynamics today compared to Bible times. He has said that this issue... Wow. Uh, wow. There's something different about today. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I mean, if anything, wasn't the Roman world worse? Oh, yeah. They, they wasn't were, it worse? As far as I know, they were. Way worse. I mean, there was, when's the last time you drove down the street, you know, on your way home, and you saw a hundred, uh, you know, crucifixions on the side of the road? <laughs> and how many contrabines did these uh, people have? Uh, these kings and everything yeah. else, and wires. I mean, come on. Ridiculous. is not like is. other sins and so whatever he means by that i can't be 100 percent sure but it sounds like he has created a special framework for approaching this issue um and i know that his heart is to reach people but in the process of 
uh, going down this path of compassion, I think the lack of conviction has kept has um, allowed him to kind of go off the rails of biblical faithfulness in maybe with good intentions to reach people. Just um, a little. But it was really clear that he said things that were not biblical. And so here we are. The one question that has yet to be answered, though, is how would his late father, Dr. Charles Stanley, feel about all of this? While there's no way to actually know the answer to that question, we do have small indications of how Charles has spoken about it in the past. His approach is different from mine. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be good for both of us to be just alike. Thank you for growing up, being who you are. And I couldn't be more proud of you and Beck and how God has hey, used up both of you all in the most wonderful <clears throat> way. So I want to say thank you for being Andy. Well, I appreciate that. It is undeniable that Andy Stanley has had an enormous impact on the evangelical church over the last 25 years. You, you know, like, there are some things that you do want to translate to your son, though. Oh, yeah. You know, like, like you do want them to be biblically faithful. You do want them to, you know, be a, uh, a biblical Christian. I mean, what other authority do we have to describe that we are a Christian Right. Apart from the Bible, we, we can make anything a Christian. You know, I can go out in my backyard and make a bush. I could turn it into a Christian, right. you know, but I mean, that doesn't mean that it's actually a Christian. Right. You know, it's like you, you do want, I, I don't know what to make of that. I, I even think like, you know, Charles Stanley is obviously very old when he's saying this to his son. It's his son. I don't know that I agree. I've got two boys. Like, right. I'm going to love my boys. Well, I mean, but I mean, if I feel like they're wrong, I'm, isn't that no. part of loving them? <laughs> I mean, what, I mean, the Bible says that it talks about the, spare the rod, spoil the child. If I love my child, I actually correct them. Right. And I think the same thing translates into being a pastor. Well, it does say that in the Bible too, that we took corrections off our father, but when it came to God, we kind of like shunned him. That's not the exact wording, but that's basically what it says in the Bible. And that you know, we took this from our fathers. You know, we should take it from the Lord. And I look at it this way, too. It, being a father and loving my kids, part of love is discipline. You don't do it because you hate them. You do it because you love them. And you don't, like, they cross the street and you don't want them to. What if they got hit with a car? I mean, and you, you yell at them, you discipline them, you maybe spank them for doing what they did. Maybe to put an implant, or not implant, uh, an impression on their mind that, you know, this could desperately lead to your death and i'm just trying to help you and you know to explain it to a child they're going to either go with you or they're not but that's the main main thing i know with me that i didn't do it because i hate my kids i did it because i love my kids and i don't want them to get hurt or injured you have to i mean even god was that way with with the people he stole that way yeah. he's going to spank you or do whatever to keep you on a straight and narrow and tell you the truth I'm glad God does. Because Me too. I'm glad. You need it. He, I, he yeah. disciplines those whom he loves. That's a big part of uh, pastoral ministry is doing the work of correction, right. admonition. Um, that's a big part of it. And, you know, correcting rebuke, re right. reproof. That's a big part of pastoral ministry. If you're not doing that, you're not doing pastoral ministry. You're, I mean, you can say that you're. that's what you're doing. I mean, maybe... North Point Church has just become a giant self-help. There's something more dynamic to the Christian life. There's there's worship. When you take communion, that, that communion means something. You know, it, it's reminiscent of the sacrifice that Christ right. made for your sins. So you don't, in the words of Paul, because we're under grace, not under the law, but under grace, do we walk in sin? Certainly not. No. And, um, you know, that that could be evidence that you are actually not under grace at all. And I, I think that's a, that's a, a stern <clears throat> war, word of warning for, you know, anybody who would listen to these kind of things and think that, that it is, um, it's a new ministry style. It's the cool thing to do. Now. It's, it's really not. I, quite frankly, you just may burn if well, you're listening to this stuff, you know. If you're blatantly in sin, how can you be serving God, or do you want to even serve God? I yeah. mean, you can say anything you want to say about, about the walk with our Lord, 
But the thing of it is, is if you're going to be going against his Bible and you're going to keep going against his word constantly, how are you saved? I mean, where, where, yep. where is a, the point where you say, I'm sorry, Lord, I, I've done wrong, yep. you know, and you admit that you're a sinner. I mean, that's part of the sinner's prayer, that you admit that you're a sinner, that you can't save yourself, that uh, you, you're not following Jesus Christ, that he died for you, you know. And, and this, this guy here, it's like, when's the last time he gave the sinner's prayer or even tried to bring a person to the Lord rather than pacify them and, oh, you're doing okay. You're sinning, but you're doing okay. I mean, come on. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, what do you do with a guy like this? Walk out of his church. <laughs> what should he do? What should he do? Yeah. Fall on his knees and repent is what he needs to do. Yeah. And ask God to open up his eyes to the truth because he's not speaking the truth. You can't act like you're smarter than everybody in the room trying to outsmart everybody by, you know, just changing your approach, you know, you, you, under the disguise of, well, I'm just saving culture. I'm saving these kids from leaving the church. Like, Since when does culture go with God? Yeah. It never has. Yeah. Culture's always been against God. Yep. What did Jesus say? They persecuted the prophets, they persecuted me, they didn't persecute you. That's what that's what the Lord said. Yeah. Amen. Hey guys, Pastor AJ here, and thanks for visiting my channel. If you don't mind, I'm gonna take just a sec to tell you about gospel ministries and our mission to help others experience, demonstrate, and share God's great gospel. If you want, you can pick up some of our merch in our YouTube store to help you communicate that same gospel message. And I'd love it if you would consider subscribing to this channel so that we can challenge your Christian walk through solid biblical teaching as it applies to culture and other issues. In addition to that, you can go to Pastor AJ where you can consider partnering with this ministry and sign up for my weekly email newsletter. Don't forget, I'm on all other social media platforms at Pastor AJ Platt. One other item that might interest you has to do with a topic that I've studied pretty extensively. It's my book, End Times Mission, that will give you a solid education on the different views of eschatology and, more importantly, your role in Jesus' kingdom while we wait for his return. This book covers the historical origins of popular end times teachings as it guides the reader to Christ's current reign in a post-millennial worldview. Oh, and one last thing. I want you to know that you know Jesus. So if you'd like to, leave a comment or send me a message so that I can help you do just that because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes.